Hi guys, I'm here today with Venus Kugavo from Canada, which is so awesome. She, I found her basically through the Gen Z Girl podcast Facebook group. She posted her own video um, talking about her experience growing up in Canada as a person of color and just with everything going on, I watched her video and I just kind of, it was one of those things where I like felt into my soul. I was like, this girl needs to come on. She's got to come on. <laughs> and I like love that it was someone that's in the Gen Z girl community and everything. And that's kind of how I wanted it to be instead of just reaching out to someone random that I didn't really have any connection with or anything. So her full name is Venus Kagavo. I just had to like get a pronunciation down for her name <laughs> and I got it right. <laughs> and um, I'm so excited to have her on. And I just wanted to express my utmost gratitude for you being so brave to come on today and talk about all of this because I know it can be hard and it is hard and it's something I will never understand as a privileged white female. So I'm going to go ahead and let you introduce yourself to everyone and give them the rundown of who you are. All right. So hello, everyone. My name is Venus Kagavo, as Abby said. <laughs> um, I live in Saskatchewan, Canada, which is like the prairies of the country. Um, it's a predominantly um, white community. I There's not a lot of people of color here. Um, and like I said in my video, I kind of grew up as being like the only black and person of color in a lot of my classes and everything like that. Um, and now I'm like blanking. I'm like, what is there about myself? <laughs> Who am I? <laughs> but yeah, um, I basically posted that video on YouTube and I had a lot of experiences that I felt I needed to share with others because I felt that there's a lot of people, um, especially like black younger kids that are going through the same thing or have went through the same thing. And it's not anything to be ashamed of. It's, um, it's hard to be confident in your identity when you feel like it's a bad thing. And so um, that's basically why I felt compelled to make that video. Cause I was like, you know what? Anytime I speak up, like someone will message me and be like, thank you for this. And I'm like, I have the opportunity to reach more people. And like, I don't, I don't have a problem with sharing my story and with speaking up. And I know for a lot of people, um, a lot of black individuals, people have been going to them, asking them to share their experiences. And I know that that can be overwhelming when that's not necessarily something you want to do. And so I felt as someone who likes speaking up, like sharing their voice. Um, it was important for me to do and to keep doing because I feel like I'm helping out the people who are really overwhelmed during this whole thing right now. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. I know, absolutely. I mean, there's always like going to be that one person that you can re like get through using your voice. Like, I mean, and at the end of the day, if you reach one person, you know, that has a multiplier effect, you know, and that's going to help them and help the rest of their life and help other people in their life and everything. So it's really, yeah. really great that you have decided, you know, this is something I'm comfortable with, good at. You have an amazing voice. You're so like composed and just, you come off so like mature and just like radiant. And I'm just like, okay, you're just Thank like a natural. You. <laughs> and um, so it's really great that you're able to, you know, use your experience, especially being, you know, a kind of a solo person of color growing up. I that really like broke my heart, you know, whenever you said it's hard to figure out who you are when you feel like you have to be ashamed of it when you really, I mean, shouldn't be at all ever. And I right. hate that that is what you had to feel growing up, which is part of the reason why you're on here today to give everyone a perspective of that. So, um, like you said, um, you did post that video and everything, and I will leave that in the show notes for everyone. If they want to watch it, I'll post it in the Gen Z girl, Facebook podcast group and everything like that. But um, I just want to kind of, for those who haven't watched your video yet, if there's any specific experiences you want to go through um, just growing up as a person of color in Canada, because like you said, I mean, you obviously have a different perspective here um, in Canada and not in the States, but, um, you know, racism exists everywhere. It's not just here in the United States and it's definitely a global problem. So if you want to expand on any of those experiences, that'd be awesome. Yeah. So um I think that people think that Canada is just like a perfect place and that there's no racism whatsoever. But um, the truth is, 
Canada has a long history with racism and it extends to indigenous people, it extends to um, Chinese people, it extends to black people. And it's not something that you hear about often. Um, I think, honestly, I believe that racism is something that's learned. And I think that's the issue is that it was learned so far back, like generation wise, that it's like, um, sorry, voice crack, <laughs> puberty. <laughs> and, um, it's something that's learned. And I feel like um, in school, we're not taught necessarily how to correct it. We're just taught that things happened and we shouldn't be happy about them. And I think that's a big issue. So I know for me, um, a lot of the racism that I've experienced has been from older people. And I always make the excuse for them, which is not a good excuse, but like, it's true. It's, they, they don't, they have, they, they learn that behavior. Like they don't, they don't really know anything different. Um, so one of like the most overwhelming experiences that I had was like, I was at the grocery store with my mom and we were just shopping like everybody else. And um, I wasn't paying attention, but my mom was like, I heard my mom say, hey, don't say that. And I was like, what happened? She's like, that guy said, um, oh, look. And then he said the N word, hard R. And I was like, and I was like, I literally felt like fire running through my veins. I was, I was so angry. And I, my mom was like, don't say anything. Just let him go. Because for her, it's like, what's the point of, causing a scene or you know drawing attention but then I was like no we're not letting him get away with that so I followed him and I was like hey what did you just say and like I'm not proud necessarily of how I handled it but like when something like that happens you're just overwhelmed with so many emotions you're like you're angry you're upset and um I remember saying to him I was like it's 2020, people aren't the N-word anymore, they're human beings, and he was like, and he just, he had nothing to say, and I was like, so now, now you're, you're quiet, yeah. now you're quiet, and like, that was, it was a crazy moment for me, and it's something that I'll never forget, and I feel like anytime I experience something like that, you never forget it, and you always, you always remember it, because it's like I said, it's a humiliating, it's an embarrassing feeling to be for someone to try and belittle you like that and to like in public attack you like that with just like no hesitation. Yeah. And so that experience is one that I didn't touch on in the video, but it is one that has stuck with me. Like it sticks with me. I remember after I had yelled at the guy, I started crying in the store because I was just so like, yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, like this is still happening. And um, there's so many more experiences that I could be, I could talk about, but it's like, um, it's still very prevalent and it's very, it's, it's, an, it's a very big issue. Um, and I don't think a lot of people are aware of the racism that exists in Canada and it's towards many groups of people it's not just towards black people absolutely yeah that's I mean like you said it's 2020 like what the heck I mean and the fact that you know you're just going to the grocery store something that I can go and do without thought and that's just and that had to be like a traumatic experience for you and that's just that really really shows how much of you know a problem it is because and how privileged I mean I am and we are anybody else who's white as a white person, because we can go do something, go pick up some milk if we want to without second thought. And for you, you know, there's negative feelings associated with that. And that's just so awful. And it is something that needs to be changed. I really liked what you said about um, racism, you know, the way they, the way it's taught in school or whatever, or not taught, but they never correct it. And that's so true. You know, they're just like, this is a, hey, this is a bad thing. Like, you know, eh, don't participate yeah. in it, whatever. But they never, I feel like it needs to be something um, where teachers or anybody really, like even the kids in classes, whatever it is, know how to pick up on it and respond to it instead of just, you know, staying silent about it or just being like, hey, don't say that again. You know, you have to go further than that to actually make a lasting change. Yeah. It's like, how are you supposed to do better if you don't know better? Exactly. And it's like, 
that's why I think we're at the place that we are today. There's so many people who are like, I honestly didn't know that this was an issue. And it's because you weren't exposed to it. Like, and for me, I feel like a big part of it is like your education system fails you in a sense. Like they can tell you about these things, but if they don't tell you how to not be a part of the problem, then exactly now we're at this place where we have people looking for edu- like looking for resources to educate themselves. And it's like, I want to be mad, but I'm like, it's such like, there's so many levels to the issue. Right. So, right. Right. Okay. Heading into the next question. Um, this is one that I like feel like I've re- that has really stuck with me. Um, throughout everything happening. Did you ever feel like you didn't have the same opportunities that your privileged counterparts did growing up? Um, I just see a lot of, especially when I watched the racial wealth gap explained on Netflix, that thing, which I obviously knew it existed, but like seeing like statistical data, I mean, like numbers thrown out, I was like, holy freaking crap. Like this is very real and it's so bad and so sad. I just feel like, um, the fact that like a person's skin color can subject them to less opportunities down the road is so sad because it doesn't allow them to, you know, pursue their passions necessarily as easily as someone that's white can. And obviously, you know, that like, that's something I'm really passionate about was like sharing my passions and getting people to discover theirs. So like, Mm -hmm. that's why it really, you know, struck a nerve in me, I think. But um, I think that, you know, your neighborhood you grow up in, the family income, um, the schools you attend, all of that can really affect Uh, the opportunities that, you know, someone would get as a person of color. So with that, did you ever feel that you were in that situation? And what do you think we can do or do better to make sure people of color, you know, get those equal opportunities, especially in school and in the workforce? Okay, so um, obviously, I can't speak for Black people in the United States, because I don't know really what it's like, or what the experiences are like for them. But I know in Canada, for me, it really has come down to just having access to and like knowledge of opportunities um, because I come from like an immigrant family. Um, If I don't like, there's a lot of things that I just didn't know existed and there's no way for me to like utilize those things. Whereas a lot of people, they're like, they're born into families where they have access to and they have so many opportunities already there for them. And I feel like as a person of color, when you come from an immigrant family, you often need to seek out those opportunities and you also have to create those opportunities for yourself. And it kind of puts you at a disadvantage. Um, I think just not having access, like a lot of people have connections and I'm just like, I don't have connections because my parents came here as refugees. They don't know anybody, right? Right. And so in that sense, that's kind of um, how I feel like I haven't had like the same opportunities as my counterparts but um that that's like the main thing um but I also wanted to touch on um just in the states I know people don't really understand or they don't understand how um they feel like they've had to work hard so they're not privileged or anything like that but I don't think people realize how deeply ingrained the um this issue is in the system so like I was watching a video and it was like um you could have a a black kid and he grows up in a neighborhood that's predominantly black and it's low income and so their school is funded by property taxes or stuff like that And so if you have low income neighborhood and you probably, you're not getting a lot of funding into your school, but then you have a kid that is white, he's in a wealthy neighborhood and his school is funded by those those same taxes, but they're wealthy. So the school is better funded, right? Um, And people wonder like, how did it get that way? And how does it impact people? Um, It's like... (laughs) In older generations, sorry, I don't know if I'm making sense. I'm trying to make sense and put this all together. <laughs> um, like way back in the day, um, the grandparents of these Black individuals, they were denied bank loans to get to buy houses based on the color of their skin. Um, and depending on where they lived, cities would mark off places that were undesirable and they didn't want to um, invest in 
and it was predominantly like black individuals. And so banks were more likely to loan to low income white families than high income black families. And so you see how that can be a problem for generations because we know that two of the key items to success is college education and having a good place to live. So college education, if your grandparents wanted to apply to like higher education, they didn't have many options because they were black and segregation was an issue. But your white counterparts were, were able to, they had so many options and so many opportunities to be able to high education and pursue the best education because their skin color didn't matter, right? And so how that affects us today is we see that um, people with black sounding names on resumes, there's a study done, people with black sounding names um, on resumes are uh, twice as likely to not get a callback compared to people with white sounding names. Um, on resumes yeah and then you have the unemployment rate which is high for black individuals Uh and then you wonder why and then you have this bias that black people are lazy and then (laughs) and it's like you know it just keeps going yeah and so it's like basically this all stems from slavery right Uh because slavery is what started it so now this issue has 400 years later it's still a problem So really what it comes down to, in my opinion, is looking at the system and changing it and seeing how we can make it so that everyone has equal opportunities. No one is denied of any opportunities because of the color of their skin. And yeah. I agree. My mouth is dry. I just talk so much. (laughs) Yeah. After this, you're going to be like, I need water. (laughs) Let me take a little sip. No, you're fine. Take a water break if you need it. Yeah. I it's so crazy. I mean, just all the statistics with, you know, the unemployment rate being, you know, twice as high for people of color. And it's just that it truly is something that just at the bottom line, like the system has to change because that's truly where it's broken because this country has been built on a broken system. So we're seeing the consequences of that now. And, you know, luckily, and we are, you know, for the most part banding together to um, try and change that. And unfortunately, Going into the next question, you know, it's taken us far too long to get in a position where all of us can band together, come together and be allies with people of color in the Black Lives Matter movement. And it should have been that way all along. And um, I just want you to expand on the importance of other races being allies to the Black Lives Matter movement and why saying all lives matter is wrong um, and how it silences people of color. Um, and how can white people, you know, be genuine supporters rather than just hopping on this Black Lives Matter bandwagon that some people perceive to be as just a trend when it's not? And, um, you know, just that whole problem with being purely performative when um, trying to take a stand to appear anti-racist. Okay, so that's a packed question. It is. But a lot of you need to be reminded um, of it, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, starting with the importance of basically having diversity in the support of the movement, um, it comes down to the fact that while um, Black people are the focus of the movement, we're always stronger together. It is so important to have people of different races supporting the movement because at the end of the day, it's a human rights issue. And I don't think, I, I, it, I don't know how successful anything can really be if only the people that are being oppressed are the ones trying to fight for change, right? Exactly. So, so um, people that may indirectly be contributing to the oppression, it's important for them to get educated. And that could be people of different colors. That could be white people. That could be Hispanic people. That could be, you know what I mean? Like, it's important for everyone to be educated. And then for them to become allies, they can also recruit other people who may not listen, unfortunate, who may not listen, unfortunately, to people of color. So it's like you have power and you have privilege. And by becoming an ally, you're able to use your privilege for good. And that's why I think it's important for everyone to be an ally, really, because in some sense, you do have privilege. You have people that are willing to listen to you over somebody else, right? So that's really why I think it's important. Um, 
and now all lives matter. Okay. <laughs> so um, my thing with all lives matter is that it only started being a theme when people started saying black lives matter. Like people were not saying all lives matter all these years. <laughs> like, <laughs> and like, I looked at this post the other day and it was like, when um, the Boston bombing happened, people weren't saying, what about some other place? You know what I mean? Like, or if people were showing support for breast cancer, people aren't like, what about colon cancer? Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, it's only started to be a thing to like rebuke the Black Lives Matter movement. Like you're saying all lives matter. I don't think you're saying it because you really think all lives matter. I think you're just saying it because you don't like that one race is getting attention yeah. or like yeah, it's not yeah. it's not because you actually care. But um the issue with saying all lives matter is really just that of course all lives matter and um the issue right now is that black lives are being taken away by police at a, an alarmingly high rate compared to other races. Yeah. And so if we truly believe that all lives matter I think saying Black Lives Matter implies that all lives matter because right now, Black lives don't matter. So that yeah. means all lives do not matter. Yeah. So it's kind of like a, like they think they're doing something by saying that, <laughs> but yeah. it's like, but it's like, that's the issue. We're trying to make people understand that all lives matter because right now it doesn't seem that way, right? So um, by saying all lives matter, you're kind of just taking away from the specific group that's being oppressed right now and it's just it's not enough to say all lives matter it's you need to confront the issue head on and you need to say black lives matter because right. black lives are the ones that are being affected right now and if it was any other race we would say their lives matter exactly. because you know so there's that that's all I have to say about that like it's simply just that like we know all lives matter that's yes. why we're doing what we're doing right now Yes. What was the second? What was the next one? <laughs> yeah, it was just the um, how can white people be genuine supporters rather than being purely performative or like hopping on the bandwagon? Okay. Yeah. Um. So, I know for me, following like a lot of influencers and you know just like seeing a lot of my um, favorite people just posting about this, it's definitely hard to feel like people are being genuine. Yeah. But I do really feel like at the end of the day, and I've given this a lot of thought, we have to assume that people are being genuine because yeah. we're wasting time going back and forth, assuming that people aren't being genuine. Wow. By me assuming that people are being genuine, I can keep educating them and having conversations and just helping them, giving them more resources. Whether they're performing, whatever they're doing, or like whatever their true intentions are, they're still spreading the message. Mm -hmm. And I just have to trust and believe that they're doing it from the bottom of their heart and because they actually care. And I feel like this is an issue where like, if you're speaking up on about this and you don't truly care, but I, I mean, <laughs> yeah, you're saying you don't care about human rights, my friend. Yeah. So. Are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So for me, I just feel like we really need to try and just see the best in people and in their intent intentions and the truth is some of these people saying that they didn't know any better it's true they really didn't know any better because of the environments that they grew up in right. but now we have the opportunity to educate them and to create diets and dialogue and so I think that's what we should be focused on rather than trying to figure out who's genuine and who's not being genuine because it's really it's not productive no it's not that's a very very mature mindset and just way to approach that because I can't understand um, what it's like to be on the other end. And, you know, I'm sure the first instinct is to just be like, is this person being genuine or not? And for you to have that mental, you know, strength to just sit there and just be like, you know, hey, it's not productive for me to sit here and question this. I just need to assume that this is genuine, this is real, and that they are reaching people through doing this. And, you know, you just have to trust that until, you know, it reveals itself otherwise, you know what I mean? So that's a very, yeah. I haven't heard that said a lot, but I think that that's a very 
um, what's the word, productive and mature way of thinking about it and going about it. So I really yeah. liked that explanation. Um, like I've seen a lot of influencers just posting about how they're being attacked because they, because they're not either not doing enough or they're not genuine. And I'm like, we are taking away from the important conversation yes. and the main focus. And it just, it just doesn't make sense to me to keep picking people apart and saying, well, this is not, this is, you're being, you're performing, you're not being genuine. It's like, yeah. you're taking away from the voices and the focus of the movement. And like, a lot of the time, it has to be said, I feel like it's not people of color that are saying these things. Yes, I know. And That's so like, true. It's like, it's not your place to decide mm-hmm. if it's genuine or not. Absolutely. And not. honestly, the same could be said about that person too. So it's like, just shut up. <laughs> are you pregnant? <laughs> and, no. <laughs> Let's focus on educate. the real matter. Yeah, yeah. just educate, yeah. Right. Right. Okay, so going into tokenism, I saw it in your notes that you wanted to talk about this, and it's definitely a very pertinent issue that's been an issue for a long time within corporations, companies, um, friendships, families, communities, sororities and fraternities and colleges, um, really everywhere, and it's really important for everyone to realize that making an effort to appear as though they are inclusive of minority groups and promote racial equality by including that small number of the minority group um, is not being anti-racist. And just how can somebody, you know, diversify their friend group uh, by actually promoting racial equality without tokenizing? So honestly, I was thinking about this and the truth is it's very simple. You just need to use like a genuine effort to make friends with people Absolutely. because at the end of the day the way you make a white friend is the same way you make a black friend you yes know? Like, <laughs> like there's no step by step right and you don't need to like pretend to try and like understand their experiences yeah. or anything like that you just need to be genuine in your effort and um the thing with tokenizing is like I've seen a lot of people and just companies talk about how we have so many black people on our team or so many like just black partners and everyone's like how come we've never seen these people yeah it's like like where like like, (laughs) literally like like where (laughs) so like it's just you just have to be genuine like that's really all it is that's so true you don't need to think about it as like I want to make a black friend. Right. You want to make a friend. (laughs) Yeah. There's no like, oh my gosh, that's so true. That's really, that's really all it is. Like, it's just see them for the person that they are, not for the color of their skin or, and don't think of it as a way to make you feel better about yourself. Just, yeah, that's, like, that's really all I can say about that. Cause it's like, what else is there really? I love that. I mean, it's because, it, and it's truly like your answer is so simple, and it's because it is as simple as that. Like, it's that's it. But um, I wanted you, or I know you wanted to talk about black culture, um, the exposure to it, the importance of black hairstyles, making excuses for singing the N word in songs, all of that. I'll let you um, kind of expand on all that as you wish. Okay, so basically everything about black culture, um, about the N word. If you're not of Black heritage, you do not have the place to tell another Black person what they can and can't be upset about. If you're consuming Black culture also, you should be speaking up and being an ally of this movement. Um, But specifically about the N-word, I I really wanted to, to touch on this because the common argument is that well if they use it or if it's in songs why can't I say it and it's because it doesn't hold the same trauma or just emotional importance to you compared to a black person right so when someone really does say when someone says that black people using this word is their their way to take it back and to change the meaning that is what it is. You cannot say that that's not true. And that doesn't mean that it doesn't still hold any um, power to hurt them. Because I know that, like, for me, 
I don't think people that aren't black should say the word but I also don't say it myself or use it myself because I know it's still it's hurtful for me right and so like a person that's not black can never tell me how to feel about the word and should never tell me how to feel about the word because it doesn't have the same importance to them so I think it's really just about knowing your place (laughs) yeah (laughs) like your ancestors did not endure the same hardship you know so you can't tell us how we should feel about other people using the word, especially when it was used in as a, like, as a racial slur yeah. to, you know, so just don't use it. Yeah. <laughs> like what's, what's the purpose? What are you trying to accomplish? Yeah, it's not your if place. If you can so. skip a swear word in a song, you can skip, like it's so easy to skip oh. the oh my word. Gosh, yeah, absolutely. Like, <laughs> if I can skip it, anyone else can skip it, like replace it with something else, like just it's not that hard. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. So what are some signs of racism that people may not even realize that they're doing or saying or performing? Okay. So um, I actually wrote a paper on microaggressions. So it's like things that are like kind of racist that you may yeah. not realize. Um, so I'll just give some examples. Um, people really might not think that these are racist, but they're not they're just not good things to say so like the other day at work actually I had a man come out to me and say where are you from I was like I was born in Canada and he's like but like where are you really from and I was like I was born here and before he could even let me answer he was like Jamaica and I'm like I'm like (laughs) you would not go up to another white person and say that no. <laughs> it's only because I look different that you like that you assume that I'm not from here but I was born here yeah. I can show you my birth certificate <laughs> or it's like me when I have my braids people are like is that your real hair and I'm like do you ask the girl with curly hair beside us if that's her real hair right it's like you wouldn't ask anybody else that or it's like um even just like in the healthcare setting because I want to be a nurse and so um a lot of the time black women are always immediately assumed to be a nurse and not the doctor right and it's just like why is that like you can't see a black woman in a position of power like that it's like I don't know and then I have like another experience so like I took an anthropology class in my first year of university and my professor (laughs) just went on this whole talk about just black culture and she was like yeah so black people are typically better at sports um like for example basketball and I was the only black person in the class and she walks up to me and she says do you play basketball and I was like (laughs) Um, I was like (laughs) ma'am (laughs) ma'am I was like, no, I don't. And it's bold of you to assume that every black person plays basketball. (laughs) And it's just like, it's like, it's little things like that, you know? And it's like, you need to think about it and be like, would I ask somebody else this question that isn't black? You know? It's just like, and it's not that you're trying to be racist, but it's kind of just like, it's things to be mindful of, you yes, know? Yes, exactly. Just staying it's mindful. like, I see you're different and I want to, and I'm pointing out that you're different and it's just like, right. Why? Right. <laughs> you know? I get that. It's just like, I mean, staying mindful and it kind of goes back to like the whole being genuine thing. Like, like you said, you wouldn't do it to the person sitting next to them with curly hair. You wouldn't, you know what I mean? You wouldn't ask a white person what sport, if they play a certain sport. Cause you know what I mean? Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, like I've never, I've never looked at like a white person and thought, is that your real hair? Yeah. Or, like, where are you actually from? I'm like, right. It just doesn't go through my head. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> and a lot of us um, have witnessed, you know, people staying silent. We've seen a lot of that having, um, just like being in a position where they didn't really want to speak up because they were scared of saying the wrong thing, didn't know how to say something, um, didn't know what to say. And they were so focused on saying the right thing, quote unquote. Um, how can non-blacks that want to speak up, um, but are afraid to do so? 
um, and being able to stand up without being, you know, misconstrued and stuff like that. So that's another thing where I think just being genuine is very important. And if this is new territory for you, acknowledging that you don't know everything and that you're still learning is very important. And it is difficult to have conversations with your family because it's your family. And sometimes like these are just really hard conversations to have, but it's important to create dialogue that doesn't turn into attacks because yeah. that's not productive and it doesn't get anywhere. Um, and for and a lot of the time, what I do and I find it's helpful for a lot of other people that are not black is to, to just recommend resources. Yeah. So you could be like, hey, let's sit down and watch this movie together, you know? And if that person chooses to not want to participate, you can't force it upon somebody. You just might not be the person that's able to um, show them a different perspective. Right. You can really, you can really only do so much, and you shouldn't beat yourself up about not being able to change somebody's mind about what they believe. Um, so just, I don't know. Just think about how also you would like to learn about an issue that you don't know much about and provide that experience for other people it's yeah it's hard it's it's definitely it's difficult because you can't get through to people the same way like there's no universal way to do it right right so um you should feel good about even wanting to engage in conversation and to um, help them understand something that they don't understand so just know that effort any effort is appreciated and good effort absolutely yeah I think that that's such a good point to make that you know not everybody's going to be that person to you know make it make that difference and educate that person and just always continuously making that effort and being genuine with it's really important and um I think at the end of the day you know that effort it being there and doing all you can just can go a long way. And it's important to, cause like something for me, like I feel like I need to be that person for everyone. So it's very, you know, it's good to be reminded, you know, as long as I'm doing what I can to get to as many people as I can, I can feel like I don't have to, I don't have that as much of that pressure of, oh, I need to say this. I have to say the perfect thing, the right thing. That's, you know, that's not, that shouldn't be yeah. something that people are worried about, but a lot of people with it being their first time, getting educated, speaking about all this, it is a common um, worry, I guess, that people have. And going off of that, you know, a lot of people everywhere are having these difficult conversations with friends and family members um, that, you know, either haven't really been exposed to this because they've grown up in a bubble or, you know, maybe they have some, you know, racist underlying, you know, feelings and that needs to be changed. And a lot of us in the um, Gen Z and millennial group are recognizing that and wanting to have those conversations. So um, for how can we have those productive and civil conversations with those who aren't as open-minded and may um, just be kind of closed off to having that conversation? That's a really great question. And it's one that I still struggle with. Um, for me, I've realized that sometimes my effort is better used, my effort and my energy is better used somewhere else instead of trying to engage in conversation with someone who's just not trying to have it. And I think that's, I'm not like, I'm not saying to give up necessarily, but I'm saying it's going to take a lot more than just one conversation and, you know, sending them one article to convince them. And I think it's going to take a team effort. And I think that it's important to remember that it's not your responsibility to get through to that person. And honestly, it's something that I still haven't figured out because for, for a lot of people that have um, come from a closed-minded like view and have changed their beliefs, it kind of seems like it was just like one experience that kind of just changed things for them. And so I don't really have the answers for that. I think it's just important to keep engaging and trying to engage in conversation and not getting, not getting angry when things don't go as planned. Yes. Um, because things aren't always going to go the way you want them to, right? 
Um, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's something that like, I really, I still don't know the answer to and I'm still trying to figure out because there's still a lot of people here in my hometown that are close-minded and they aren't open to learning or trying to change their views. And so I don't know how to get through to them, but I'm still, I'm not going to stop having the conversations. Right. You know? Yeah. Like not giving up. And I think that as hard as it can be to have patience, especially with those that are maybe close friends and family members, it's so important to stay patient and realize that it may not be that one conversation that makes a difference. Like it may be the fourth conversation you have or some conversation they have with somebody on that they just like see in a store or something, you know, it's they, like you said, sometimes there's just that one experience. And that's kind of like why I shared, um, I shared on my Instagram story sometime like last week, there was, um, the whole, like kind of, it was referencing Luke 15 in the Bible. And I know that, you know, me as a Christian, like a lot of, I've seen a lot of, I feel like I've seen a lot of Christians kind of struggle with the whole Black Lives Matter thing. And that whole Luke 15 is basically all about like one lost sheep and Jesus going after the one lost sheep when there's, you know, 99 others. And it's kind of comparing the whole Black Lives Matter to All Lives Matter situation. And I shared that on my story because I was like, I know for a fact there are Christians following me that probably don't really understand, like, I don't know why, like, I, I really don't know why, but like, they can't really get themselves to understand why it's Black Lives Matter, not All Lives Matter. So I shared it to be a perspective from something that they do understand so that maybe they could understand a little bit better, maybe like just inch towards understanding, you know what I mean? Just try and get them to understand better, even if it's just a slight bit better for right now. So yeah. Exactly. That's, and that's actually really awesome. Um, You can't use the same examples or the same conversation for all people because not everyone's going to understand things the same way right and so you using an example that is more relevant and more that they that people can understand more is so helpful because Mm -hmm. it may actually you know change their minds you know so it's important I think to also think like you if you know the person and you know, like what's really important to them. It's using examples yes. that are more relevant to them to educate them because that can help them see, oh, okay, that's, this is not okay. Right. <laughs> so right. needs to change. <laughs> that's so true. Using those examples that are closer to them and their hearts will likely get farther than just like using some universal, like, you know, yeah. here's this. But um, now a question that I know a lot of people have been asking, it was something that I, it was one of the first questions I asked myself, you know, like, how can I get educated? How can I do better? As soon as all this was starting, which now I feel like, thankfully, a lot of people are using their platforms, even just friends of mine who, you know, may not be influencers, everybody's sharing resources mm-hmm. and ways to get educated, which is great. But I know in the beginning, I was kind of like, I don't know where to start. Um, but I guess for more of a long-term lasting. This is a part of my lifestyle. This is not something, you know, I'm just partaking in a trend. How can white people get educated and do better um, for their life, not just for right now? Yeah. um, So I think there's actually this Google doc that is like a master list of resources. Yeah. Yeah. And like, um, I think it's exposing yourself to things that are different. So like, for example, like media, I think it's important to expose yourself to people of color. Like um, with this whole Blackout Tuesday thing, I think, I, I, I wasn't on Instagram at the time, but I think the goal was to like amplify Black voices. Yeah. And the thing was like, if you were scrolling through your feed and all you saw was black squares, that's kind of a sign that <laughs> you might need to diversify your yeah. feed. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, I think it's kind of just about diversifying and like, um, it's, there's, there's a lot of levels to it. Um, so for, for one, I'd say for sure, diversify your feed. Um, instead of going on social media looking for like entertainment I think it's important to go on there looking for educational yes things as well 
So change what you're following. I realized I had to do that too. For me, in order for me to stay updated on things that were going on, like important things that are going on, I had to change completely who I was following. Right. Um, So I think it's making an effort to be more aware of the things going on in the world. So that's whether that's following like independent news outlets, you know, like just making sure you constantly have access to that information. So since like I said social media is a big part of our world right now it's making sure that your social media reflects what's going on right um because that's really how you stay educated and um I I just I I stay engaging with with people that are you know oppressed or people of color I agree yeah really like what else can you do right right I agree and going off of that with just diversifying, you know, your feed, what you're consuming and everything. Um, I've always been someone that's tried to consume, you know, not what I've never liked consuming one side of the media exclusively just because it really polarizes your mind to everything else going on. Yeah. Um, and I try to consume as much as I can from more non-biased, you know, sources like the wall street journal and associated press mm-hmm. and stuff. But, um, I personally believe that that polarization often causes those actual topics at hand that are being discussed. Um, it kind of turns into opposing Americans against each other rather than the actual issue at hand, um, which is a problem. And I think that the media and government do want us to be divided ultimately to have that banter and that this versus that chatter when at the end of the day, first of all, this is not a political movement. This is a human rights movement. Mm -hmm. And um, with that, we've seen all 50 states come together for the first time. Like, I don't know the last time all 50 states came together to fight for one common goal and issue, which is amazing. And um, I think that we both agree that talking about how the media is portraying these protests and um, just the way that they are delivering that is harmful. So what are your thoughts on that? My issue with the media... (laughs) Yeah. there's a list <laughs> so I think a lot of like the popular uh media outlets like CNN or like Fox and, like all those places they do a really good job of um showing the protests that turn violent yes <laughs> and only showing the protests that turn violent I don't know if it's for like like entertainment I, like, I don't know what the goal really is yeah but um for a lot of people, how they get their news is by watching those popular outlets. And so if you are seeing these protests turning violent, you're going to assume that all the protests turn violent and that the whole movement is violent. And that doesn't help the cause. I don't yes. think they're helping the cause when they try and consider both sides. It's like you're not considering both sides because you're only showing the things that turn violent. You're not showing the protests that just simply remain as protests, they don't turn violent. You see, you see um, like peaceful conversation going between police officers and the protesters. Like, I guess maybe it doesn't serve them or uh, help them to show those peaceful protests. Right. But like, like um, I don't know. I just think with the media having the power it does it's very shameful that they choose to show to show those things that have the opportunity to turn people away from supporting a movement that is about human rights and not about looting stores and doing all of that like they don't show that there is the one protest in Minneapolis like it turned into um, looting and this one guy's bar was destroyed and like it burnt down and so he started to go fund me and the goal was a hundred thousand and he has raised over one million dollars and it's like they don't show that like the goal of these protests is to not loot it's right. not to loot everything and destroy everything and a lot of the people that are looting are not really affiliated with the protest no you know not at all. they see this as an they see this as an opportunity to go and get exactly get a new tv like (laughs) you're missing the point here like go home exactly so it's it's wrong to affiliate um the riots and everything with the actual movement because that's not what it's about exactly yeah you have to keep that in mind and i think it's very important which i think this is something that older generations have more of a problem with is 
they just turn on the TV and they watch that same channel all day long. No matter what channel it is, they're glued to that one channel and that's all they see and it's very polarizing and it is a problem. So I totally yeah. agree with you on all of that. It takes away from the movement and it's just really important to I almost try and actively seek out the pot, like, and it's not even just with this. I mean, like anytime there's something tragic going on and the news is just capitalizing on it, I'm like, let me try and, I always try and find, you know, like that, the more positive, like the real side of it that isn't okay. just being blown up in the news. And it's really, I know I saw like a Twitter thread of like 250 like different videos of just peaceful protests that were just, I mean, and it was so amazing to watch. Like it, it's sad that like, you know, we're just now doing it, but it was so amazing to watch, to see people come together in so many different areas across the nation and the world even. And, um, it was really great. And kind of going, um, off of that as well, I want to end on this note. Um, I know there's a lot to say in regard to voting, the importance of voting, especially right now. Um, and as well as the contradiction that lies within supporting Black Lives Matter and also supporting President Donald Trump. So you can expand on that all you want. Okay, some of y'all Trump supporters are about to be real mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> but the truth is, the leader of your nation right now is proving to be not a leader. Right. Um, in my opinion, the president should want to unify the people, not divide the people. Um, the president should want to, should not want to, um, encourage war on its citizens exactly <laughs> like well <Like>, there <laughs> <laughs> like when i was reading all that stuff i'm like in what sense is this man a leader uh, yeah because, you know i realize that not like there's gonna be republicans there's gonna be democrats there's gonna be independent people and that's the beauty of the system is that you can believe whatever you want to believe. Right. But there's also right and there's wrong. And I feel like a lot of people are realizing from all sides that like the way that this has been handled, it's not, the, the goal has not been to unify the people. It's been divisive and it's been divisive for the whole four years that he's been in office. It's, yeah. it's really, and it's like, it's not me saying, oh, go, go, the Democrat, because right. I don't necessarily know if I believe the other option is the <laughs> I best get you. option, yeah. Yeah. but it's like, you have to realize that there's an issue, and you need to take that into consideration when you're voting, because nothing's going to change if nothing changes, right? So, right. um, when you see people speaking speaking out and you know condemning this behavior, be open to that and let that impact your vote. Honestly, think yeah. about how the the past four years have been handled, and some people are going to say it's awesome, it's been great, and chances are those people are very privileged and have never been oppressed. Right. And I think if you're really about what's best for the country, you're going to think about all people. You're exactly. not going to think about just yourself. Just and you so, and your bubble, right? Exactly. So um, all I want to say really is think about how these situations have been handled. Uh, think about the leader you want for the country and think about if the current leader has really been a leader. Yeah. And if, if the things being said really promote what you believe and yeah yeah I get you girl I mean that's it's so important to kind of recognize you know that it is a problem when you know the leader of the country isn't uniting on a human rights issue like that mm -hmm. it's very divisive and that's just not good for the country in any sense ever no matter you know who the president would be if any president is causing division um like literally in regard to a human rights issue that's just not exactly productive at the end of the day and it's not going to change anything like you said so and it's not about it's not about the fact that he's republican because i don't believe that all republicans are racist i don't believe all right you, know, you can't paint them with the same brush exactly and so like this very well could have been a democratic president as well at yeah. the end of the day it comes down to the fact that he's not being a leader 
he's not unifying his country like he should be doing. Exactly. And that could have been a different party, you know? Right. And, and we would have called it out too, you know? Exactly, but either it's, way. It's, it's not about being Republican or being, Democrat, uh, being a Democrat. And I don't think, I want people to really realize that, like, it's just looking at the leader and realizing he's not a leader. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know? it's as simple as that. I totally agree with you. Yeah. And yeah. that is all of, I mean, the questions I had, and I'm glad you got to address everything you wanted to talk about. And you literally knocked it out of the park. Like your, your voice is incredible. Like both like the actual sound of it and like just how you use it. You are literally wise by, beyond your years. The amount of times, like while you were talking, I was just like, this girl, like I was, I really feel like I learned so much, like, and I do have a lot to learn as someone that comes from a place of privilege and a bubble. And I'm ashamed of myself that, you know, I didn't use my platform earlier, but at the end of the day, I'm an influencer and I hope all other influencers had this realization, but who am I to call myself an influencer if I'm not influencing about actually important matters at the end of the day? Like, come on. And it's, also, Abby, what's important is that now you are learning and you're doing what you can yes. to help the movement and you are a true ally and you shouldn't beat yourself up about things you can't change. What matters is what you're doing and what you're, how you're contributing to the future and how you're contributing to making a change. Yeah, so for sure. You should be proud of yourself for that. Thank you. And you should be proud of yourself for coming on here and I mean, sharing all of this. And I know it's going to help so many people. And it was truly very, I mean, informative, educational and all of that for everyone. So we, I'm going to leave like, you know, all, cause I'm going to post this on YouTube too, YouTube and on the podcast show notes, description box, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to leave as many resources as I possibly can. Um, I'll leave Venus's YouTube channel, her video that she did. If you guys want to hear more of an expansion on her background and her um, growing up and everything. And I just really am so grateful you came on. And I'm like so glad I got to like e meet you or whatever you want to call it. I know. You're so great. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to see her in the flesh. But... <laughs> in the flesh. <laughs> I love um, that. There's one more thing that I just wanted to oh, say. Oh, yeah. Um, and it's to just everyone out there um, use your voice, no matter how big or small it is. Um, whether you reach one person or 10,000 people, your voice is important and it needs to be heard. Your experiences are important and you should never feel any different. So yes, that's a great, I always great ending thought that my, I always thought that my voice didn't matter because I'm not like the big influencer, but everybody's voice matters. So yes, you it does. It does. Well, thank you so much yes. for coming on. Of course.